All right. So um, one of the reasons why I feel that we don't see a lot of working of the power in the church, the working of uh, seeing God move, is because we don't understand the authority of God. And the authority of God and at work in our lives in our church today um, isn't seen as, as much in, in, in its moving. Um, do we have the scriptures ready? So let's bring up Job 36, 11. It says, if they listen and obey God, they will be blessed with prosperity throughout their lives. All their years will be pleasant. But if they refuse to listen to him, they will cross over the river of death, dying from lack of understanding. So I just want to start out with that verse to show us that. Uh, can we go back to 11? Okay, so it starts out, if they listen and obey God, they will be blessed with prosperity throughout their lives and their years will be pleasant. So God's authority, submission to authority and God's authority always comes with a blessing. It's, it's not a negative, oppressive thing. It comes with a blessing. And I feel that without understanding authority and God's direct authority over our lives and also his delegated authority over our lives, we can't be in authority over the devil. And we can't bring others into the authority of Christ or into the kingdom of Christ, into God's kingdom. And um, so being in God's kingdom and under God's, um, oh, nope, sorry, his notes. <laughs> James 1.16 says, don't be deceived. And I want to bring up uh, Romans 12.2 as well to read. It says, don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So again, we see that God's will is good and it's pleasing and it's perfect. And, um, and so we can see that God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts aren't our thoughts. God's kingdom isn't like the world's kingdom. They're, it's very different from worldly culture. So if we look at the kingdom of God in the Bible, and we look at the, world, the way that the world does things, we can see that they're at odds with each other. Sometimes they're just polar opposites. Like the kingdom of God says, be servants of all. The last shall be first, right? And the world system tells us, you know, you're the boss, you're in control, you, you, be, you be on top. And the Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself. And the world says... You love yourself first and heck with everybody else, you know, looking out for numero uno here. And the, the Bible says, forgive those who hurt you. And the, and the world says, you hold on to that unforgiveness. They owe you, right? And the Bible says, pray for those who despitefully use you. And the world says, mm, you get as far away from those people as possible and you never talk to them again. And the Bible says, give your money away. <laughs> Right? How is that so opposite from our, our worldly culture? It says, get all the money you can, however you can, and keep all you can. Right? So we can see that God's culture and God's ways is completely different than uh, the world's ways. And that's not a bad thing. And as Christians, we want to fall directly under God's kingdom. Amen. Oh, yeah. wow. <laughs> so God's kingdom is one of um, authority. You know, as you recall, God created the heavens and the earth. There was a command structure. God the Father, Christ created the world, the Spirit moved on the waters. Everything that is in existence is under, the chain, under a chain of command or God's authority. That's how it's supposed to exist. God's kingdom is organized. It's designed to be, he's the king. We take commands. Unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, but... The area in the demographic area that we as Christians we live in is very demo, um, democratic in its approach to authority, meaning that laws and morality are established based on the popular uh, opinion or belief of the masses. And that leaves naturally each one of us with a culture that we're when we come out of this world, it, there's a leftover culture in us that says, well, if I don't agree with something, I can justify it in my own heart and I'll find a way around it. Or I must just not understand this right now. God wouldn't ask me to do this. Clearly, I don't understand it. I'm going to put this on the shelf and I'll come back to it when I'm ready for it. And so God is saying, no, just be obedient. I have authority. I want you to come under it. And the kingdom of Satan is very democratic in its approach. See, the kingdom of Satan is set up on rebellion. And so when the enemy comes to us, 
and wants us to go against the law of God, he's, what he's really saying is join my rebellion. Now, we all have freedom in God. We, all, we, we hear this all the time. Oh, there's freedom in Christ Jesus, right? Does anybody agree with that? There's freedom in Christ. Why? If God is an authoritative king, where's this freedom? See, it's not a worldly understood concept. And we also have free will. Do we have free will? Can I see hands in this note? Head nods, free will, you have free will? That's good, okay. Free will doesn't exist without choice to obey. Do what thou wilt is not free will. It's rebellion. So God gives us good things. When we remained under God's authority, we act as an act of our free will. There is freedom because the result of those choices fall to God. When you decide to do something on your own merit, steam, strength, perception, decision, or reasoning, what you actually are end up doing is you're taking the consequences for the fallout, whatever they be, good or bad. When we step out from what God is saying, do this, don't do this, because we chafe at it or for whatever reason, what we're actually doing is we're taking responsibility for the outcome. And it eliminates God's ability to bring freedom in that situation now. Because we've said, in my own strength, Lord God, this, my strength is sufficient. So, and what we um, may perceive as our own strength and our own decision and our free will and I'm doing a good thing is actually Satan's rebellion. There's, a, there's only two forces at work in this world. We know what they are. You're either one, under one or the other. Don't be deceived. There is no third party. You're not some independent third party. That boat sailed when we fell. Okay. So there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end there of thereof is death. Now, an example of this would be Saul in the Old Testament. Everybody's familiar with Saul. Now, I've heard it said many, many times that Saul, uh, you guys know who I'm talking about? I didn't see enough head nods. Okay, first king of Israel. Okay, the people are all like, God, we don't like your rule. We don't like your kingship. We want to be like everybody else. Give us a king like everybody else. Okay, give us what we want. So God gives them Saul. Now, the Bible says, and, and sometimes people look at this and they're like, oh, Saul. He's just, you know, God gave them the best looking guy, the tallest guy, you know, just, you know, in the worldly sense. But the Bible says that he was the best of the best. Like he was taller. The Bible says he had goodness. God tried to give them the, because God loves his people, God gave them the best chance they could with the best man. And so here you have Saul. He's anointed. And then he ends up prophesying, if you recall. Meets up with the prophets, prophesies. So now he's, he's, he's full on prophet, full on king. And now they're going to battle. And Samuel says, look, before you go to battle, there has to be a sacrifice made. Wait until I come to do that sacrifice. Because there's a level, there's, a, there's an authority here. God, Samuel as his prophet, and then the king of Israel. And what he's saying is, Saul, don't step out of turn here. Remain. Remain under authority. Remain under God's authority. So what happened? You remember the story that, the, that his armies were gathered together and then so were the enemies. And because everybody was waiting for the sacrifice, a week goes by. And Saul's looking around and his troops are running off because they're afraid. They're like, we don't know what's going on. I'm not, I, the longer they had to stare at the enemy, the more their fear grew. And they're like, I'm out of here. And Saul's looking around. And he's like, I'm going to lose my army here. How am I supposed to win a war if I don't have an army? You know, and he's not thinking, I have God. All he can see is his circumstances. And so what does he do? Does anybody remember what he did? He went up. I'm a prophet. Why can't I do this? I'm a king and a leader. And my people are looking to me. He, he, people, it's easy to justify. Okay? So he steps up, does the sacrifice, and immediately Samuel shows up. What have you done? And if you read through the passage, you discover that at that very moment, Samuel pronounces that his line will end and will not inherit the throne right there. Because 
one faithful decision, he came out from under God's authority. But in that same passage, God actually, Samuel actually says that if you had obeyed, your, your family line would have been established forever. So coming out from under authority is serious. So, okay. <laughs> Tag team. All right, so we can see from what Chris said that the world tells us to rebel is freedom, submission, boo, bad, you know, that's, that's oppression. But we see that God's kingdom tells us the direct opposite. To be under God's authority is freedom, and to be in rebellion is, um, is bondage, and the end is bondage. We saw that with King Saul. So let's take a look at Satan's rebellion, and uh, we'll take a look at that. And so, um, everybody's, is everyone familiar with the fall of Satan? So he was the chief archangel of heaven. He was the minstrel, the, uh, the chief worship leader. And uh, he created the songs. He, he praised the Lord. He, he worshipped the Lord. He led a team of angels to worship the Lord. He was before the throne of God night and day. And then one day he thought to himself, I can do that job. Look at God. All he does is just sit there. <laughs> I make the songs. I'm the one who sings them. He wouldn't even be praised right now if it wasn't for me. And rebellion crept into his heart. And the Bible says that in a flash, in a moment, he was cast out of heaven. And so we can see that Satan had a heart, and it was his choice to have a heart of rebellion that caused him to sin, to have this pride come out of him and say, I will be God, I will ascend the hill of Zion, instead of worshiping the Lord. And so from that, what we can take from is that we can see that rebellion really is the start of sin. Satan didn't sin because um, sin, sin was in his heart and then he rebelled because of it, but rather he, uh, sin has, comes out of rebellion. So he had a heart of rebellion first. His heart was rebellious towards God. He had iniquity in his heart, and out of that came the sin of pride. And we know that the Bible says to submit to God and resist the devil. And how do we submit to God? We come under his authority. How do we resist the devil? By resisting that temptation to be rebellious, to follow in his kingdom, his kingdom of rebellion. And so we'll always find ourselves in one of two camps of heart attitudes. Either we're going to be in love and in submission to uh, the authority of God, or we're going to be kicking against it and in submission to rebellion. And I want to take a look at Romans 13, 1 to 2. It says, everyone must submit to governing authorities, for all authority comes from God. And those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. So we can see, oh, wait, number two, sorry. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against God and what he has instituted, and they will be punished. And we can see that with Satan, that he rebelled against the authority of God. You don't, you're not the boss of me, God, anymore. You know, I don't need to listen to you. You know, you wouldn't even be great and be praised in heaven if it weren't for me. And his heart was full of rebellion against the Lord. And so he, we can see that he was punished. And uh, I wanted to share, uh, at the women's breakfast, I shared this testimony, but I wanted to share it again with all of you. Um, I have my own horrible, <laughs> it's like sort of like an anti-testimony, like this is what you should not do. Uh, about my working condition when I was working at Riverside Squash and Fitness Club. I was uh, freshly married, no children, no, I think I had Mercedes, and uh, I was working at this gym, and I was a personal trainer and a fitness instructor there, and uh, the my bosses were East Indian, and um, I think I sort of had like a preset prejudice in my heart against the whole thing. And, uh, but they owned the building, and then there was another man, uh, Brian Townsend, who was running the building, and um, uh, about a month later, he leaves. And then, I, you know, you hear all the staff murmuring, you know, it's because the Sadhus were unfair, so he had to leave. And I'm like, oh, they're unfair. They're bad people. Oh, you know, like, this, this isn't good. And so we go on a little bit longer, and uh, now they're looking for a fitness manager. And uh, I was a fitness manager before this job at a Good Life Fitness, so I'm like, I should be the fitness manager. Like, I can do this job. Like, I was a master trainer at Good Life Fitness. Like, no problem to do this job. So I apply, and I didn't get it. And uh, I was kind of dismayed. <laughs> I was like, what the heck? Like, why did I, like, I deserve to have that job. I'm qualified for this job. And so I couldn't think of, like, why would they wouldn't want me? And so I figured it must have been my age or something, because I was pretty young at the time, early 20s, and they had hired um, this other lady. And 
So more time goes on, and my heart is steadfastly rebellious against the seduce. Like, I can just tell you, I, I was just, I think the evilness in my heart in this situation, I was just looking for them to mess up so that I could prove that they weren't good. And my chance came when they were away in Toronto for a couple of weeks, and uh, it was one, one morning, uh, it was to teach a step class, and uh, the fitness manager also wasn't there at the time. And um, Jacinda, one of the front desk ladies, she comes out and she's like, you know, uh, we don't have insurance. And I was like, what? She's like, yeah. She's like, the seduce aren't insured. And I was like, I knew it. They are evil. And so I, my heart was immediately like, yes, let's rebel so much, and I'm embarrassed to say this, to the point that I went in front of my class of like 20 ladies, all dressed, They'd, they took the time to get up and come to the gym, and they're all dressed, they're wearing their running shoes, we're about to do the step class, I'm like, sorry guys, we can't do the step class, we don't have insurance. And they're all like, what? And I can only imagine how much gossip I started in that. Anyway, so I told you, it's embarrassing. It's kind of like, the, don't do that. So, uh, so anyways, uh, everybody goes home, and that afternoon, the fitness manager comes in, and she's like, what happened here? And I was like, we don't have insurance. Like, if I would have did a step class and somebody got hurt, I would have been on the line, you know? And she's like, of course we have insurance. She says, you don't, you don't run a fitness club without insurance. She's like, what were you thinking? And I was just like, oh, yeah, that wasn't good. So time, more time goes on. My heart's still not in a great place. She leaves, and I'm like, oh, yeah, now I'm going to get the fitness position. You don't think the seduce knew exactly where my heart was at. I'm pretty sure they knew. So anyways, surprise, surprise, I don't get it. Then I'm, now I'm offended, and I start applying. I just like, you know, like, you know how they make it rain? It was like me with resumes just everywhere. And I was constantly coming home and complaining to Chris. Oh, the seduce. Oh, they're making me do too much. They're asking too much of me. Now I'm supposed to be a personal trainer and a fitness instructor. Now I'm cleaning. Now I'm doing the front desk. Now I've got to, like, check the pool. Now I've got to clean up the, the, the change rooms. And I was, I was just complaining, complaining, complaining all the time. I was just very rebellious in my heart. And lo and behold, not one single person called me back with my resumes. I mean, like, Tim Hortons wouldn't call me back. I just got nothing. I was just like a pariah. And after a while, I was like, God, what is going on? And he's like, you know what's going on. And I was just like, yeah, I do. And I knew instantly that my heart was in the wrong place. My heart was so far out in left field in the wrong place. It was so far out in the wrong place that I used to like daydream on my spare time how I was going to burn my bridge with the seduce. I was like, oh, yeah. I'm going to get another job, and then I'm just going to march in there, and this is exactly what I'm going to say. And I'm just going to put kerosene and some tinder and everything on that bridge, and I'm just going to light that baby up, or maybe I'll blow it up. Or maybe maybe I'll just, like, set fire to it, and then maybe I'll just chop that bridge. Like, I was so ready to burn that bridge. My heart was just so hard. And uh, the Lord was like, you need to change, and you need to change the way you speak about them. Well, like, they're your bosses. And I was like... How many know it's, it's difficult to submit to authority you don't like? And I, I'm sure I'm the only person who's thought those thoughts, you know, burning bridges and being mean to bosses. I'm the only terrible person in here. But it happens. I mean, you know, the, you might run into it. So just watch out for that. And um, so God began to change my heart. And the first thing he said, he says, stop speaking badly about them. I was like, okay, I can do that. He's like, at home. And I was like, uh, Okay. <laughs> And I had to stop complaining to my husband about these people. And I had to start doing a good job. I used to sit at the front desk and play games on the computer when I, you know, like when it wasn't busy. Well, they weren't paying me to play computer games. So I started being more diligent, actually doing my job, doing my job well as an unto the Lord. And lo and behold, my attitude started to change. And my heart began to change. Did the seduce change? No, they were exactly the same as they always were. But my heart attitude towards them had completely flipped around. And um, on the same day that I found out that I was pregnant with Hunter, um, a place called me, uh, Community Partners for Success at the time, I think they're closed down now, but they called me on the same day to say I'd gotten the job, which was higher paying and less work, which I thought was wonderful because I was pregnant. And I was like, but I'm pregnant. So like in nine months, you know, like I'm out of here. They're like, no, no, no problem. We're fine. We love, you know, family. Like the, the fact that you're pregnant is no problem whatsoever. 
And uh, so I accepted the job, but my heart attitude had changed so much at the time that I didn't want to leave the Sedus without a fitness instructor. So I stayed on for months um, teaching classes for them until they could find somebody else. And God says, okay, now take it one step further. And I'm like, well, what do you want me to do? She's like, he's like, give her a gift when you leave. It's like, you're not only just not going to burn that bridge, you're going you're gonna to just make it like a rainbow bridge. So I was like, okay. So I went to the mall and I bought the most expensive gold bracelet that I could afford at the time because I know that in their culture gold is very important. And I gifted it to her. And she was just like, oh you know, so happy, and I felt great, and I really felt like my heart was in the right place, and I went on to this uh, new job that paid more, and I got to sit around all day, which was, like, lovely, because <laughs> after a while, you know, the belly got a little heavy, and so that's my testimony, and I want to bring up Psalm 51, 16 to 17. It says, you do not desire a sacrifice, or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O God. And it was really my heart attitude that had needed to change, and God did change it, and I was so grateful for that. Okay. Um, Allison wanted me to come out with my own testimony. And so once upon a time, in a land far, far away called Trinity Fire, um, I was trained originally under a gentleman named uh, Nameless, just in case you guys know him. Um, he's not a believer. He's a professing atheist. And so needless to say, we had two separate king kingdoms sitting in a very small vehicle, you know, eight hours a day, five days a week. And so I don't know, I don't understand fully why, but it's at the time to me it seemed like Jeff's main goal in life was to torment me. So it just seemed that way. So, it, it, yeah, so um, he would, you know, he'd, he'd swear at me and call me names. And he went through, I went through a period, I kid you not, it was the enemy. And it's kind of weird. Looking back now, I just totally see the enemy all over it. I, a day would not go by that I wouldn't be on a job site where somebody who was a homosexual would, hit, would not hit on me, right? And um, Jeff would be like at me in my ear constantly saying, it just means you're gay and you don't even know it. You have a tendency there. You know, they pick up on it. He's always like, he's always trying to get under my skin, right? And sometimes he would poke me and mock me. It's like, just swear. Just, just swear at me once. Just, if you do, I will stop. I will stop everything. I'm like, I'm not going to do that. And he would just sit there and poke me. And, you know, like one time I was driving and he reached over the lighter and lit my sleeve on fire. I'm not kidding. And I'm like, it's on fire. And I'm like, like it's burning. And I'm trying to drive on the 401. So I'm like this and then I burned my arm because it was like synthetic material that melted into the skin and then on my hand. Anyways, this guy, he, he, was, he was not a nice guy. And then to top it all off, he started um, as part of my training, he made me to carry every single piece of equipment and tool in and out of the job sites while he would supervise and um, made me do all the field work. And if I didn't do it quite right and all the driving and if I didn't quite do the work right, he would call me a name and say, you know what, I just, you know what, you're stupid, you're not getting this right, I'm going to help you out, I'm doing you a favor. And he would step in and he would do it, and then he, would, he wouldn't show me how. <laughs> and then, <laughs> anyways, I love the guy. So, um, I was starting to chafe against him. You know, after a while, I was just like, I really hated him, I have to admit. And I was just like, oh God, I just wish he would just go, go away, you know, like, and um, I would complain to Allison about him all the time. And I'd be like, oh my gosh, Allison, you know this is this Jeff guy. Oh, you know, I'm, uh, oh man, you know. But I, I tried to take every opportunity I could to witness to him on several occasions, which probably is also why he didn't like me. You know, like I probably, he felt probably like I was being pushy towards him too. Because like every chance I had, I was just like, Jesus was in that. And he's like, don't. Just shut up about the Jesus thing. I don't want to hear it at work. I'm like, well, I want to hear you at work. You know, but I'm stuck with you. No, I didn't. Anyways, but I have to say, at one point, I just realized, you know what? I'm just going to love on this guy. And I'm, he's my boss, my supervisor. I'm just going to come under him. I'm just going to do everything he asks. So I started buying him lunches. Um, uh, I didn't ask him what he wanted brought in because I already knew what he'd need. So it was just passive rebellion on my end. So I just took it in without being asked. And... And, uh, 
and, and I just, you know, I basically did whatever I could, right? I did anything and everything I possibly could unless he asked to do it, and then I would just step back and let him do it. And by the time he left the company, um, it was uh, shortly after, anyways, I got married. And I invited him to my wedding, and he came to my wedding. And you know what? He, like, comes and he's all, like, proud of me now. Like, we were at a, I was at a firefighter convention thing where I was guest speaking about some fire safety issues. And he was in the audience because uh, he's um, now he heads up a paramedic service. And he comes up to me afterwards and he's like, he's talking to a few others, he's like, I trained this guy. <laughs> he's shaking my hand. He's like, yeah, this guy right here, I trained him. And he's like, looks at me, he's like, you've done so well. And I'm like, oh, thank you. <laughs> Wasn't expecting that. So to bring many into the kingdom of God and to see revival, we need to know what the br we're bringing them into. And make no mistake, revival is coming. But what are we going to bring people into? Are we going to bring them into a kingdom of authority and power with God? Or are we going to bring them into a kingdom of rebellion? And God is very, uh, he sees each one of us as very precious. And he wants to make sure that our heart is in the right space so that when he does bring in the harvest, that we're, he, we're bringing them into the best possible place, which is under the authority of Christ, which is in the kingdom of God, which is moving and working in the power of God. So we need to know what we're bringing people in to get saved from. And uh, we're just, I guess, running a little behind on time, I guess, but we'll just go through faster. the next one a little quicker. Yeah. Move faster. I apologize that I keep walking to the side of the room. It's because the youth always sit over here. So subconsciously, my legs are going in this direction. I'll try to come in this direction. Okay. So if I say the word sin, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Come on, give me sin. Just shout it out. Some, let's, let's get sin. What's sin, people? You can't answer, youth. You already know the answers. Pardon? Yes, the wages of sin are, are, are is death, but what are some sins? Just rebellion. Hey, we gave you that one. That's okay. Anybody else? Stealing. Missing the mark. Hate. Anger. Okay. Murder. Yeah, some big ones, right? Okay. Now, how do you think God sees sin or, def or defines it? How do you think God... How does God define sin? Okay, so let's pull up 1 John 3, 4. Everyone who sins is breaking God's law, for all sin is contrary to the law of God. And if some tra translations actually say, like, rebellion. Everyone who sins is breaking God's law. And so essentially, if you break God's law, you're in rebellion. Is that, can you guys put those two things together? Okay, good. It's lawlessness. So when we break God's law, we are rebelling against his rule. Now, sin came into the world through Adam. Romans 5, 19, please. Because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. But because one other person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. So that one person who disobeyed God, that's Adam. By the way, the Bible doesn't say that Eve disobeyed God directly. She was deceived. Adam is the one who disobeyed God. Eve was deceived, and she was prompted to focus on the one thing she was forbidden at the time, and then convinced that God was holding something back, and that somehow she didn't fully understand all the information, so therefore she saw the fruit as good. Um, Adam, God never told Eve directly not to eat from the fruit. Adam passed that information along. Satan went to the one who would be the easiest to convince of a lie because she didn't have first-hand information. So read your Bibles. <laughs> Satan will try to have you in doubt of God's good intent. So when you're in deception, you will rebel because if God's intent for you is in question, then so are his methods. So if Satan can come to you and whisper thoughts about your current situation, whatever it is, or the ones you'll be in, and says, look at Again, the Bible says this. We need to put that on the shelf because surely this cannot apply to this situation. Because if that just doesn't make sense, and if God's command doesn't make sense, thereby you may infer in your heart that God's intent for you is dubious. Does that, does that follow? Okay, so 
You may not have that as an active thought, but it's there. And so now we're potentially, now when that happens, you're in deception. You're convinced that what's true is actually a lie. What's God's intent for me? Maybe God doesn't know what he's talking about in this situation. Or maybe, more subtly yet, maybe I just don't interpret this properly. It seems obvious I must be missing something because God would not ask me to do this. Faith is obedience. When we substitute God's authority and law for our own, we come out from under his authority and are no longer covered by God. So understand this. When you are obedient to God, he wears the consequences and results, and he works all things for good. But if you come out from under his authority, you're not under his covering. You're exposed How can God work all things for your good if you're not working for God? You can't. He can't. Because he won't contradict free will. He will not contradict your right that he gave you and created to you to wear the ramifications of your decisions. He won't contradict that. And so when Adam and Eve sinned, they were uncovered and realized they were naked. God's presence, they came out from under that holy spiritual covering and they were totally exposed and it, everything that happens in the spirit has a physical ramification or manifestation they were naked so unless you're under god's covering you also are not going to be wearing the armor of god that is talked about in the new testament and named and listed And you also will not have any spiritual authority over the enemy. This is key. Why does the church seem so powerless? Because they're rebellious. Sorry, I don't mean to be so emphatic. People accuse me of being angry. Thus saith the Lord. Okay? But it's true. Okay? If your kids, if you say to your kids, look it, son, the river is swift and the white water is violent. Don't play down there in the springtime. Okay? If you don't do it, you'll be safe. But if you go down to the water, you're in danger. Okay? It's, it's basic logic. If God is saying don't do it or do it this way and you do it some other way, you're on your own. You have no authority. And when the enemy comes against you, you have no authority. How can you resist the devil to, and he'll flee from you if you're not, when you're already in his camp? Because if you're not in God's camp, you're not on your own. You're in his camp already. You've just hooked up forces. You're now in the rebellion movement. Okay? All right. So, sorry, I get... You guys should start coming to youth group. We have a lot of fun. Um, When we substitute God's authority and law for our own, we come out from under under his authority. So, I'm going to transgress into your area, so... Okay, so we talked about how sin is lawlessness, right? Can we go back to the previous scripture? Okay, so everyone who's breaking God's law, uh, sins is breaking God's law. So what that means is that breaking God's law is lawlessness. Okay, so, and I wanted to take a look at what Jesus had to say about this because he did have something to say. So let's go to Luke 14. 15, and we're going to read to 20. It says, Hearing this, a man sitting at the table, Jesus exclaimed, What a blessing it will be to attend a banquet in the kingdom of God. And so Jesus is like, let me tell you something about the kingdom of God. A man prepared a great feast and sent out many invitations. When the banquet was ready, he sent his servant to tell the guest, Come, the banquet is ready. But they all began making excuses. One said, I just bought a field and must inspect it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five pairs of oxen. I want to try them out. You know, I I can come. And the last one said, I now have a wife, so, you know, I can't go. So what I want to talk about is is the heart attitude. You know, outwardly we can appear, you know, very submissive, very obedient, but that's not what that is. Submission in our heart to God starts first in the heart. It's a heart attitude. And so what Jesus said is he said, um, 
take a look at these people. Now, what is so horrible that these people did? Now, we talked about sin, and we, we put out a couple of them. I heard murder, and maybe, like, adultery and lying, stealing, that kind of thing. So the first guy's like, yeah. He's like, I got this rager party I got to go to. I'm getting, like, tanked on the weekend. No, he didn't. Can we keep the scriptures up? So he said, I have to buy a piece of land. I just bought a field, and I have to inspect it. Please excuse me. Now, let me ask you a question. Is buying land a sin? No. And if it is, I'm in trouble because I just bought some. <laughs> We've got a cottage lot up, lot up north now, so I'm pretty happy about that. But when interest in possessions becomes more important to you than immediate submission to the word of God, then it's sin. And let's look at the second guy. He's like, yeah, uh, I need to murder my neighbor and bury his body so I can't come. Please have me excused from the marriage supper of the lamb. No, that's not what he said. He said, I bought five pairs of oxen. I want to try them out. Now, is buying necessary equipment for our livelihood sin? No, of course not. But when industry and business becomes more important to us than instantly obeying the word of God, then it is sin. And let's look at the last guy here. He's like, yeah, me and my secretary, we fell in love, and we're going to Hawaii for a week to have our fill of it, so uh, don't tell my wife. No, he just said, now I have a wife, so I can't come. Now, is having a wife a bad thing? No. Is taking a spouse a bad thing? No. If it was, I would be in trouble. And the Bible even says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. So we know that having a wife is good. But when the desire to please a mate or anyone else becomes more important than submitting to the will of God, it becomes sin. And so we have to start changing our viewpoint, changing the way that we look at sin to the way that God looks at sin. God sees sin completely different from us. He sees it, is our heart attitude willing to obey him? Or is our heart attitude rebellious? And then the rebellion leads to the physical manifestation of sin. And let's look at Luke 14, 24. So he goes on, he says, but none of these I first invited will even get the smallest taste of my banquet. I said, what? So here, the people who had, you know, Willy Wonka's golden tickets to come to the marriage supper of the lamb don't get to go. Why? Because they murdered and stole and like, you know, started a fire? I don't know. No, because they said, sorry, please have me excuse. Something else has filled my heart. Something else has got first place in my life. And one thing I know about God, he is not interested in occupying any other space than first place in your life. And I want to take a look that, at Matthew 24, 12 to 13. So we all know that it says in the last days, the love of many will grow cold, right? So it says, the sin will be rampant everywhere and the love of many will grow cold. This is the last days. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Can we go back to 12? So when we read this, and it says the love of many will grow cold, if you go back to the Greek, that word there, love, is the word agape. And if you've been in church any longer than probably six months, you've heard the agape love of God. And what that is is that that is the, the heartfelt we wrap around you reckless, amazing, fatherly love of God that was only first introduced in the New Testament. So the agape love of God is a New Testament concept that Christ brought into the world with his love. So if we have that kind of God, Christ-centered love, then who are they talking about here? They're talking about us. They're talking about Christians. The ones that God sent those golden tickets out to, or we can, we can see uh, or say are people even in the church. Where God is the ones I called first. The love of many will grow cold. And so let's look at the next one. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this, it says, because of sin, the love will grow cold. Now we know that sin is lawlessness, and lawlessness is essentially rebellion. And... Um, so we can read it like this. Because people despise the authority of God, Christian hearts will become as unbelievers, but those saints who endure to the end will be saved. So we've got to make sure that our hearts are in proper authority to God. We've got to make sure that our heart place is here in the kingdom of God instead of here in, in the heart of rebellion. And he's speaking that to the church today. And so when we approach our Christianity from the viewpoint that it's... It's only for, you know, it's only about you and your good and your blessings and, and, you know, the love and the favor that you'll have on your life, which are all good things. And God does pour out his blessings on us. But when we neglect the holiness and the authority of God, we rob ourselves from the power of the cross. 
We really rob ourselves from that power. And Chris is going to show you that even Jesus himself submitted to the Father as well. Yeah. So, actually, we were just talking about this at youth group the other night. When Jesus went into the garden to plead to God, Lord, if this cup of suffering, if it's possible, let it pass from my lips, he wasn't actually referring to his death. He was referring to the suffering. See, God had already, it was his destiny. He got all throughout his ministry. I'm coming to die. I'm coming to die. But nobody wants to suffer. And Christ was fully man, so he's no exception. And so what he said to God is like, look, I'm submitted to, to this death. Like, I know it's, it's part of your plan. It's got to happen. I'm being betrayed. But could the suffering part, you know, could we go easy on the suffering? Could this cup of suffering be passed from my lips? And how many times did he go back and ask? Does anybody know? Three times. God, God, God. Three times he asked. He really didn't want it. But what did he say? Okay, so as Christians, we have absolutely zero excuses, okay, to go to God and question God's motives for our lives and say, God, I don't like my circumstances. They're uncomfortable. Okay, we don't have any reason to. Christ says, in this world, you will have trouble. He spoke from firsthand experience. Okay. So, Philippians 2. Thank you. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Too many Christians cling to the idea that somehow, because we are all sons and daughters of God, that somehow we are some magically not required to suffer or we have some kind of reason that we're going to avoid something because truly God would not allow his children to suffer but yet we have we know he does and why because he has purposes for his glory though he was God sorry can you go back one so though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to so Christ was willing to not cling to his deity he was willing to be submissive as a servant even unto death and suffering. So we should also, as Christians, should not cling when it comes to obeying God. Somehow we have some divine right to not endure trouble. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. It's never just when we go through things that we think is unfair. God, my circumstances are not fair. It's unjust. Christ died a criminal's death, and he wasn't a criminal. It's not fair. But he did it. He submitted. Oh, yeah. There, therefore, okay, what's the result if we do these things? Good news. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. And I will just do a shout out to Revelations so that we are all one day going to be led as lambs to the slaughter. Which means we keep our head down and we submit. And I, I wonder why, I, sometimes I wonder how Christians can say that they're going to resist the enemy in those days. No, you're going to submit. Sorry? So, again, following up on our testimonies, um, for myself with Jeff, again, he came to my wedding. I feel like there was a breakthrough there. He even was, like, trying to take credit for what he had done in my life, and to a certain extent. And actually, I just remembered something. Near the end of my time working with Jeff, um, I th there was a moment where Jeff actually was like he was really giving it to me. And I looked at Jeff, and I had this, like, revelation from the Holy Spirit. And I looked at Jeff, and I was like, Jeff, thank you. And he's like, what for? I'm like, for being God's instrument. And he's like, I ain't nobody God's in God. What? And I'm like, yeah, he's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, you may not realize it, but I said, God has used you to shape and mold my character and my endurance and my patience. And I'm like, it's been amazing working with you and under your supervision, like, God, you may not believe in God, but oh, God has been, his hand has been on you, using you in my life. And uh, he was just like, he didn't like the idea of, uh, yeah, anyways. And for you? 
Oh, and to finish Chris's story, the next person to get the, the head tech job was Chris. So God promoted him. And the same happened for me. Um, about a year later, I've got, you know, a little hunter on my hip here, and uh, the Sadhus call me. And um, they said that um, they were remembering about how, what a fantastic uh, employee I was and would I come back and be the general manager of the, the fitness studio. And they said, actually, they said, we just want to own it, but would you run it for us? And uh, graciously, I had to decline at the time because I was happy at home with my babies. But it just goes to show that submission to authority, um, you know, if you're under authority, then God can put you in authority. If you're not submitted to authority, God can't place you over anyone else because authority comes from the top down. And what we need to do is stop looking at the person and looking at authority as uh, a distinctive of God. And we look at the authority first and that God has placed on those people. And so what Chris and I believe really the key is to seeing, I mean, other than Highway to Holiness, because that's awesome, but this goes along with that, is to seeing the power of God move in the church is to place ourselves in the proper camp. And I wanted to talk a little bit about rebellion. I, we're running, i got about two minutes left, but we're, we're okay. Can I have like five more minutes? Okay. So I just wanted to talk about rebellion has some friends. So Rebellion has some companions that likes to hang out with Rebellion. And uh, they have some names, and I'll tell them too. Complaining, murmuring, pride, jealousy, a hard heart, stubbornness, strife, control, manipulation, fear. And we took authority over a lot of these things over the highway to wholeness. And what we need to do to make sure that these things don't come back and to make sure that we keep our freedom in Christ. And I don't know if anybody ever has a, a, a seen somebody who seemed to be doing so well in an area just to slip away again. And, you know, the devil does pull on us, but we have to make that choice to step out from underneath God's covering. Maybe they complained. Maybe they stopped, you know, believing in faith, and, and the devil was able to pull them back in due to a rebellious heart. And so um, I'm going to ask Bianca and the worship team if they want to come back up, minus me. And uh, just want to lead you guys in a prayer and a confession just to resubmit our hearts to the authority of Christ this morning, if you guys are willing to submit to it. And I also want to give uh, an opportunity if you've never submitted your life to the authority of Christ, if you've never repented for the rebellion in your heart if you've never said god forgive me for my sins i want to give you an opportunity to do that as well and uh so we're gonna we're just gonna go through a quick confession we're just and then we're gonna ask the holy spirit just to reveal just to you i mean the holy spirit is all over this message because it's important to the heart of god and so he'll he'll show your heart if there's any unsubmitted areas he'll he'll bring that to your mind no problem and then we'll close. But, of course, the front will be open here for anybody who needs prayer or healing or salvation. So would everybody just stand, if you would? Okay. So if you just want to repeat after me, just say, Father God, Father God I, submit to the authority of Christ. I submit to the authority of Christ. I renounce rebellion. I renounce rebellion. And I repent of it. I ask that you would forgive my stubborn heart for exerting my self-will self instead of con coming under the submission of your authority. And God, we just repent for rebellion in our hearts. You can just say, uh, I'm just going to go through them, and if you agree with them, you, just, you can say them. We repent for pride. We repent for complaining. We repent for jealousy. God, we repent for a hard heart. We repent for strife. We repent for murmuring. We repent for control. We repent for manipulation. We repent from fear. We repent from self-will. And Holy Spirit, I just ask that you would speak to the hearts of each person here right now, Father God. And that if there's any other unsubmitted areas in our hearts, God, that you would reveal them to us. And as they come to our mind, God, we just repent of those things. God, we place ourselves in your kingdom and in your authority, God, and under your power. And Father, we, we just come under that authority and we speak out in the same words of Christ that not my will be done, God, but your will be done. 
And I thank you for the protection and for the covering of God that covers over us, for the being in the shadow of the wings of the Almighty in this place, that, God, that you cover over us. God, that your will for us is for good and not for evil. And God, even though it seems so contrary to the world today, God, we submit it to you, Father, because we know that you are good. You are a good Father, God, and we submit to you in this place.